Gentlemen, welcome for this new episode of our video series called Sartorial Talks. Today we have the pleasure to welcome you in a very special place. First of all, the building where we are is called Ponce City Market. It's located in Atlanta, in Georgia, in the United States of America. And this place, which was open a little bit less than two years ago, has become very quickly one of the must-see and must-go place in Atlanta, because they try to recreate in this city the ambiance and the warmth of a European market. So we are quite proud to be in this place today, and specifically in this shop. Cobbler Union is also a very good example of what is happening currently in the world of luxury men's shoes. A little bit of history. So in the late 1990s, the shoe market for men was easy to understand. On one hand, you had bad quality shoe for people who were wearing shoes because they needed to have something on their feet in order to walk in the street. But they had no aesthetic. And on the other hand, you had the wealthy people who were educated in the subject who were buying the high brand and the very, very good quality shoes, but they were unaffordable, uh, like Belluti in France, like John Loeb, like this kind of brand who were, for the vast majority of the people, uh, unaffordable in terms of prices. I used to go Rue Marbeuf, uh, this is where the Belluti shop was historically located, the first Belluti shop. And I was going there on Sundays to look at the windows and to admire these amazing shoes. For example, Belluti had the first hole cut. A hole cut shoe is just it's a shoe which, is, which has only one cut, that is to say one cut, nothing else. This, this shoe was absolutely, it was called Alessandro, was absolutely gorgeous. But it, the cost of the issue was, at the time, 5,000 French francs. To give you a reference, the average salary of a man in France back in these years was something around 3,500 to 4,000 francs. It means that this very pair of shoes was more expensive, than, more expensive than the salary of a normal person in France. Of course, I didn't have the means to buy this shoe. So this is why I was going on Sunday, because staying two hours in front of a window admiring a shoe <laughs> when there's people inside the shop can be a little bit embarrassing. At least on Sunday, I was not embarrassed and I could stay hours in front of this shop to look at those shoes. The internet changed the whole picture. Why? And this is the paradox of the internet, is that the internet can be looked upon as something very uh, technological, very quick, where people don't really dig inside subject and just browse pictures, etc. But on the other side, a lot of sectors and domains like shoemaking, for example, to really become interesting for the people. And now you have an enormous crowd of gentlemen of all ages and specifically young gentlemen who have a renewed interest in the world of shoemaking and in the world of luxury shoe. And Cobbler Union is a good example of this movement because now, more and more around the planet, you can find affordable shoes made according to the gospel of shoemaking by artisans, and now a gentleman who is interested in quality shoes can, can afford these shoes and can have a collection of shoes and can make a statement uh, with beautiful shoes. So something is happening in this market, which is probably one of the most dynamic market in the fashion industry since the last decade. And as far as I know, and it's the first time in history that men's shoes may be a little bit more dynamic than women's shoes globally. So it's an interesting market, and Cobra Union is a good example of what is happening. So we would like to take this opportunity to be in such a shop, which presents a lot of classic shoes to do a special episode or a series of special episodes about the different kind of shoes. And to start with, for this first episode, we're going to speak specifically about the most classical, the ultra classical shoe for men, which is called an Oxford. And an Oxford, it's actually an extension of something else that was used before the, in the, before the middle of the 19th century, Sonia. 
Yes, in fact, uh, back in the 1840s and earlier, only boots were worn with suits. No one wore shoes with, with suits, and that's precisely because the roads were in such bad form. Um, in fact, we call them dirt roads in the South. Everything, including uh, storefront property, had no so sidewalks, so the boot was worn with the suit. Here we have what we call today a Balmoral boot, but we can say that this Balmoral boot might be the ancestor of what we call today an Oxford. So you understand, we've been switching from this, which is coming back in fashion these days, but I will explain more why later. But that was the original one, and it became a low shoe like that, because year after year, the pavement had been built, and it was easier to walk in the streets. So what I show you here, it's what we call an Oxford. I don't know why, in America, it's also called a Balmoral, which is a misuse a little bit of the word because a Balmoral is something a little bit more specific that I will explain to you later. Uh, that is named after the castle of Balmoral, which is since uh, mid 19th century, one of the favorite vacation residences of the British royal family, the castle of Balmoral. What I have in my hand is a classical Oxford. What is an Oxford? It's a simple pair of shoes, mostly formal, in which you have eyelets that are directly inside the vamp of the shoe. So it's easy to understand. What I have in my hands, it's actually called today an austerity brog. And once again, it's bizarre how we use the words because it's uh, what we call a brog, it's a shoe which has perforation on it. And this one has no perforation. So, uh, by default, we call it austerity brog, means a brog without perforation. It's like you saying a car without wheels, but that's another story. So this is the basic of the basic, which has been named after the Oxford University, and according to the sources, has been invented in Scotland or Ireland, but in any case, in Great Britain. You can actually go a little more formal if you take a quality calf skin and give it a high shine, which we're told can take up to two to three days of work, but gives this the versatility of being able to become a semi-formal shoe. So you can wear it with a tuxedo, for example. So I think that would be the epitome of a formal shoe, unless you want to bump it up to the opera shoe, which could be worn for a formal suit. Opera shoe, which is called a pump. We don't have a pump right now, but it's extremely rare on the market. Very few people are still wearing these shoes. So this is the Oxford. Now we move to the next thing. So it's still an Oxford, but you see the difference between the two. This one has no perforation. This one has perforations everywhere. Okay. This is what we call a brog. Actually, this is what we call, in this case, a half brog, because it, ha it have some perforation, but not too much perforation, in opposition to this, which is called a full brog. We can see you have a lot of perforation everywhere. What is the story behind this famous brog? Originally, it has been created for a technical reason, as this was worn, of course, outside and specifically in Great Britain, and sorry for my friend from the United Kingdom, but United Kingdom is well known for the fact that it's raining a lot. So when you are going outside, this small hole had a, had a technical use back in the years. It's to help the water to get away from the shoe, so to drain the water out of the shoe. That was the original idea. So today, this broguing, this perforation, only have an aesthetic value. People love to use this as a decoration on the shoe. There's a rule that I would like you to remember. The less brogues you have on the shoe, the more formal is your shoe. The more perforation you put on your shoe, the more casual your shoe becomes. And it's easy to understand. Look, a shoe without perforation, is immediately more formal. A shoe with a little bit of perforation start to be a little bit more casual, but these days it's totally okay to wear this with a business suit. But if you go to a much more broad shoe like this one, this one start to be a little bit 
more casual than this one. So the rule is this one. The less perforation, the more formal. The most perforation, the more casual. It's quite easy to remember. On these three shoes, you have those two shoes who have what we call a cap toe, which is the end of the shoe. This one has no perforation. This one has perforation. And this one is called a wingtip. As you can see, at the end of the shoe, you have this wing. We call it a wingtip. And there's a rule also here that I would like to explain to you. If you are a man with very long feet, it's good for you to wear this kind of wingtip, where the distance between the wingtip here and this part of the shoe is very short, because it has the effect to shorten a little bit the proportions and to show your feet in a less bigger way. But if, on the contrary, you have a short foot, it's better for you to choose shoes which wingtip will be more to the front of the shoe. That will elongate your foot. So this is what we call a wingtip. And really, it's all about proportions, right? Yes. So if you're looking at a man who's wearing a nice suit and it looks like his feet are, have snow skis on the bottom, the proportion's off, right? Exactly. So he can pull that wing up, and to the eye, it, make, it actually shortens the foot. We started with this, and I'm going to, I want to come back with this, because this is, as Sonia explained, back in the, until the mid-19th century, people were wearing boots, mostly high boots, but also ankle boots. I told you at the beginning of this episode that um, in this country, the United States of America, some people have uh, the habit to call an Oxford a Balmoral, which is a misuse of the world, because Balmoral is describing this feature. That is to say, this line of perforation that go all the way from the front to the back of the shoe. This is what we call a Balmoral shoe. Okay? So the feature of a Balmoral shoe is this line, which is straight from the front to the back of the shoe. I show you something which is not a Balmoral. You see this one has a wave. It goes down and then it goes up again. This is not a Balmoral perforation. This is a Balmoral perforation. Now we move with Sonia to one of my favorite subjects, which is called the specta spectator shoe. It's, sorry, it's difficult for me as a French to say a spectator shoe. We say spectateur in French. I remember the first shoe we saw on Parisian Gentleman three years ago from Cobbler Union was precisely a spectator shoe. So what is a spectator shoe? But that's very simple. The explanation is contained inside the name. A spectator shoe is a shoe for spectators. Which spectators? Back in the years, there were the people who were attending cricket games. For us French, cricket game is a very esoteric game to understand. The people who were attending cricket on cricket fields were most of the time wearing spectator shoes. And what is the definition of a spectator shoe? A spectator shoe is always bicolor. It always has two colors. It's a brogue because it's a shoe that you wear outside. And the reason why um, the darkest part of the shoe was uh, in the front and the clearest part of the shoe were more on the body of the shoe, was to protect the body. So we, a spectator shoe is made this way. The parts that are more in contact with the grass and with the field are dark, and the, the, the part of the shoe we are not in contact with the field and the grass are clearer in order to protect the aesthetic of the shoe. This is a shoe also that has seen a revival since a few years. It's also very linked to the jazz um, uh, industry and to the jazz ambience. A lot of jazz men used to wear this bicolor shoe as kind of a, you know, uh, jazz back in the years was a kind of a rebellion music, a music from music from rebels. And wearing bicolor shoes was also a statement for jazz men, you know, to to say, okay, we know the rules, we know the norm, but everybody is wearing black shoes. We like to wear black and white shoes just as a statement. So this is the story of uh, a spectator shoe, and Cobbler Union is doing, as you can see, a beautiful one. 
Last but not least, this is probably the most simple shoe, but the most difficult shoe to, to make uh, for shoemakers. And you remember I was speaking about uh, this famous shoe called Alessandro in, uh, at Berluti uh, back in the 1990s. It is what we call a hole cut. So as you can see a hole cut, it's simple. It's a simple shoe, which is, which is an Oxford, but with no cape toe, with no perforation, with nothing else than a simple cut in the middle in order to have a perforation for the eyelets. This is the most simple shoe, but the most difficult to produce. Why? Because when you have nothing to distract the eye, everything is in the last. May I remind you, for the shoe aficionado, of course you know this by heart, but the last is the shape of a shoe. Not two shoes have the same last. And you can see a last of a shoe specifically at the end of the shoe. This one is a kind of a classical last, but with a little we call it a chisel, okay? And Sonia is showing you uh, what, what is a last. So we, we start shoes with this kind of thing, which is this last is quite chiseled also, you can see here. Uh, what is interesting in the whole cut is that you have nothing to distract your eye. So it's the cut and the last that you see. And so most of the time, if you want to spot a good shoemaker, look at his whole cut and it will tell you immediately if you are in a good place for shoes or not. And this one is absolutely gorgeous. What I like about this one specifically is, of course it is a ready to wear shoe, but there's some nice features here. For example, if you flip the shoe over, you notice that the waist is, is fairly narrow for a ready to wear shoe. And you can see a lot of detail in the way it's sculpted on the bottom of the shoe. Mm -hmm. um, secondly, uh, this is a very nice feature that the, the lace closure is quite tight. You're not seeing the open V. Now, depending on how your foot is built, you might get some opening right here if your foot's wider, but it's a very nice lace closure in this shoe. You'll notice the place where it's cut is in the back when they call it a hole cut. And some shoemakers, bespoke shoemakers, are actually even able to avoid this um, cut. There's only one cut here. And so it's a gorgeous shoe, and you can really see the refinement of the shape because of the lack of cuts in the shoe. This is a stylistic statement to have a hole cut shoe. Uh, I may add on this one, this is quite uh, unusual for ready to wear. This is what we call a bevel waist, a violin bevel waist, to be more precise. Here you have what you call the shank. There's a nice story about the shank. The shank is a small piece of plastic or metal or wood or leather, depending on the construction of the shoe, which is pl placed here in order to reinforce the shoe. When you're dealing with a whole cut, you can really see whether you have good or poor quality. As you know, there are natural defects in every piece of leather. You're talking about insect bites, even the stress level of the cows can sometimes be seen in the quality of the, the leather. Um, the quality of the leather in this shoe it appears quite nicely. If you can see, there's, there's little variation in color. Um, the shoe looks like uh, it's been sourced from a, from a great leather um, company. And it's just something to be aware of when you get a hole cut to really take a look at the leather quality um, before you invest in the shoe. And for that, you have to believe in your eyes, but also in your hand. So we've been covering in this episode the Oxford shoe, which is the main category of men's shoe, specifically uh, for business and formal shoe. Austerity brogs, cap toe brogs, wingtip, full brog, Balmoral boots, spectator shoe, and whole cut. I hope I will have the pleasure to see you again in the next episode of Sotorial Talks. Cheers. Mm -hmm.